really, really little brief little uh, thought right now. And that is, um, that is lately, the Lord has been showing me more and more things about the Bible and about the, the message of grace and about the love of God that I've been overwhelmed. And I decided I need 10 more years to tell you. All the stuff that I've been learning, I, I feel like uh, I'm just starting to understand the Bible and grace and love. You ever have those moments where you just go to another place, another plateau of connecting with what God has. And there are some things that I have never preached on that I've never shared in ways I've never shared that I want to over the next few years with you. Um, and, and it'll take me, it'll definitely take me a while to be able to do, to do that and share with you. But we are headed in that direction, even with some things I'm going to talk to you today about. Today, I'm in a short little series called You Are in Christ. This is part two. It's going to be a four part series. I want to talk to you about your place in Christ. When I'm finished with this series, I'm doing another series that will take us into December. So this will be part of, this will be mostly November and part of December. I'm going to share with you, I, right now, it's either the, it's the top five or top seven. I can't, I'm not sure which it is, five, six or seven, of the most important truths from the Bible that I've learned, that have changed my life. I just thought I'm going to go and share with you the biggest things that when I learned that, it made a drastic change in my life. So that will be after we complete this series. I don't know what I'm going to call it. Um, I, have, I, have, I don't have a clue yet. yet. Uh, truths that I've learned that have changed my life. Who knows? <laughs> Here's, it's coming at you, you know, kind of thing. But I, when I was preparing for today, I felt, I heard the voice of the Lord inside my heart. Not an audible voice, not like outwardly, but it was very strong. And I heard him say, to come and stand in front of you and say this statement. Say this, these phrases. God is really proud of you. He's really proud of you. He's proud of your faith. He's proud of your consistency. He loves you. He told me just to stand in front of you and said, you know what? I'm really pleased at the, what they're doing in life. And God just wanted to be a father to you. Every child needs to hear from dad. I'm proud of you. Now, some of you I could tell by your body language, your eye expressions, and hearing your thoughts that you are thinking, gosh, how could he be proud of me? I have made so many mistakes. I've done a few things wrong. But you know what? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love is long suffering. If God is going to ask you to be long suffering, he's even longer suffering with you. God looks at what you've done and where you're going, not what you haven't accomplished or what you have failed at. Do you ever look at a little toddler who gets up and starts to walk and then falls down, makes two steps and falls down? What's everybody in the room do? <laughs> right? Big smiles come over mom and dad and cheers are happening. Yeah. Or they say the first word. They, and it, it's not even a word, but you want it to be a word and you count it as a word. And it's usually mom or dad who's ever holding the child. Oh, oh, he said dad. No, he said burp, you know. <laughs> But, you know, you still, you're cheering and you're cheering and you're cheering. If you have the ability and the capacity to do that with a child, how much more does God do that for you? How much more? Two weeks ago, I, I, my part one of this series was much more. That God does much, much more in your life. Today, I want to talk about your place in Christ. If you can comprehend what I have to share with you today... And if you can meditate on it and get it part of your life, hearing it doesn't mean you've got it, but you've got to meditate on it, you've got to hear it, you've got to think about it, you've got to put it, and you've got to see yourself in Christ. If you can do this, then wherever you're at in life, you are taking the presence of God with you. So many of us leave God at home when we go to work. 
We go to a board meeting. We go to a meeting. We go to our, our whatever it might be. We go to work. We go to drive, um, um, do a project, whatever it is, wherever you work, whatever it is you do. A lot of us leave God at home and when we come home, we pick him up again. But you, we need to go in Christ. We need to be everywhere we go. We need to have God with us. We need to be ready to pray for people. We need to be ready to encourage people. We need to be ready that we need to be ready to share the love of God. Here is an amazing truth that you need to grasp. And that is you can't give away anything you don't own. You don't have the right to give away anything that you don't own own. And if you don't own that God loves you, how can you share the love of God with someone else? If you don't own who you are in Christ, how can you share the power and presence of the Holy Spirit with someone else? You've got to own who you are in Christ. And when you do, it changes your life. It makes life very, very different on what's important in life, what matters in life. So I want to talk to you about your place in Christ. It all began with this Bible verse in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, several weeks back. In this Bible verse, it says, because as he is, so are we in this world. That Bible verse is really a mind blower. I mean, right? You try to grasp that, get that in your mind. Say, wait a minute, as he is, so are we in this world. Religion doesn't believe it. And religion preaches against it. The religion says that there, there's no way you could be like Christ. There's no way you could be like God. It doesn't say that we are God. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. But how is it we are that? How can we be him in this world if we reject stuff, if our head doesn't allow us to understand who we are in Christ. And today I want you to understand, I want you to understand that you are very, very, very unique, very different. I talked to you a little bit about that when we were, and I did that series on you are not only human, but with that information, we've got to go a little bit deeper on what is it you are. Now, I asked this question, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? Maybe another one. Who are you? Do you know, I could put another question up here. Where do you get your identity? Where, where is your identity coming from? I, my identity should not come from my sexuality, my political viewpoint. Should not come from my age, the color of my skin. My identity. I am not a white person. I am a believer in Christ. I am not white, yellow, black, red. I am a believer in Christ. I am not. Okay, let me show you a couple of things that I think that will actually help you because you should not be getting your identity from what you do, but who you are. So here's a couple of Bible verses. I'm going to throw a bunch of them out to you today, but there is no way around it. I just have to pound you with some truths from the word of God in Christ. In, in Galatians chapter 2, now I'm going to just share from several chapters of the book of Galatians right now and bombard you with a couple of stuff. It says here, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You are not who you are because of what you do. You do what you do because of who you are. You don't become something in the church by doing something. You do something because you are something. I love throwing those out because I have no clue where they come from except deep inside some cavern in the brain and that the Holy Spirit is using. But you have to understand that you, your identification should not be who you are should not be what you do or what you drive or where you live because that works both ways. Some people who uh, live in a very large home can think something. Some people in a very, very, very small home or living in a park can think something else. And if your identification comes from what you have or don't have, then you are missing about who you are in Christ. You're missing who you are in Christ. And I love this Bible verse in chapter 3, verse 28 of Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. There is neither Catholic nor Protestant. There is neither, it continues. I'm going to give you the amplified version. There is neither, there is neither Democrat or Republican. There is neither, and it says right there, it says male or female. There is, there is neither old or young, but all are in Christ. And if you do not see that you are one in Christ Jesus, then you're going to miss out on a whole bunch of stuff. If you come into life and you beat yourself up by saying, I can't achieve something because of my age, because of my sex, because of my color, you are going to miss what God has for you. If you come into life and say, I can achieve something because of my resources, because of my age, because of my color. You are going to miss God. If you're dependent upon the natural things of this world to move in the kingdom of God, you're going to miss what God has for you. God's got far more for your life than what you see. Now, I shared with you in that series that I did that you are not only human, that you live in a unique situation. On planet Earth, we have two categories of people. We have the categories of people who are called non-believers and then the category of, that are called believers. The believers have a recreated spirit. They are residents of heaven and earth at the exact same time. How does that happen? I don't know. I don't really get it, but I'm going to show you some Bible verses that it says it's true. You're here and there at the exact same time. But our little peewee brains want us to understand everything in the natural world, in this physical world. We don't understand that God's world, his spiritual world, includes the physical world. Therefore, stuff happens differently. In this world where the non-believers are, in that world, they live like Gentiles. They, are, they argue about the color of their skin, about their political position, about their sexuality. They argue about um, their money. They argue about their country they're from. They argue about the country they live in. There's all of this stuff. And the Bible says we shouldn't be like that. We, the body of believers, should be one in Christ. We should be uni united in Jesus Christ unified by the word of God and that we should know who we are and what we have so that we can use it in this world to change this group of people. It's very, very important. The next thing I want you to see is Galatians 5, 16. For in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So here's what it's telling you. It's not what you do that makes you important. It's who you are, and you're a believer in Jesus. If you're a believer in Jesus, then you are an important individual in the eyes of God, and he wants to do something through you. You do not impress God. Here it says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. It's trying to say that your relationship with God is based off of your faith in him, not what you've done for him. I heard a preacher say recently, because I was listening to his sermon from the church that he pastors, and it um, made me really think. And his comment was this. What is the normal Christian life? What is the normal Christian life? Jesus made this statement. I've come to give you peace. But he also said this. All you that are heavy laden and burdened, Come, and I'll give you rest. Do you remember that? But yet, the average church wants to take the brand new Christian and ne never let them experience rest. They want them experience service. Most of us think that the normal Christian life is what you do. It's not what you rest in. There's a big difference. Where is all the rest that Jesus talked about? My personality, my bent, is one. One that is, believes that you must earn everything in life. That you must earn appreciation from people. You must earn favor of people. My, my makeup 
in my flesh, not my spirit, my makeup, goes into life thinking this, you already dislike me and now I have to win you over. That is a horrible place to live. It's horrible. I, so you approach every new relationship with, I know you don't like me. Now I've got to figure out how to get you to like me. But what's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with it is you are living within yourself. In your own place, not in who you are from Christ, not in that rebirth, not in the, the being, being found in God. Then what takes place is that you get more concerned about what other people think than what God thinks. And then you approach God the same way. I know you don't like me. And now I got to get you to like me. I got to do something for you to like me. And I know I'm not the only one this way. I know there's a lot of people... That, that go this way. I, you know, my vision of God for years and years and years has been he's mad. He's always mad. He's just mad. <laughs> just really mad. The, when they, they did that, um, the movie, Heaven is for Real. And at the end, when they, did you see the movie? Yes. Okay. Book's great. Movie's good. But at the very, very end, when the little boy sees the picture of the picture of Jesus and his smiley face that was painted by another girl, he goes, oh, that's him. That's the one I saw. That was he. That, that's the picture of Jesus. That's, that's who I met. And then he went outside to go play. That's like, whoa. That picture. So I searched on the Internet, found it on that girl's website, you know, and took it and put it because that is what I want to see. That smiley face, those warm eyes, that welcome because my bent and my flesh goes a different way. Seen as a mad God that's never happy and sin is his kryptonite. Do you know how many Christians believe sin is kryptonite to God? I don't know how many times I heard a sermon. God cannot be in the presence of sin. I had trouble with that. And here's why I had trouble with it. I thought God was everywhere. If God is everywhere, uh, I think he's been around sin. And I have to ask this question. Is God's goal to get you to stop sinning? That's an impossible goal until you die. Think about it. The average Christian thinks, my goal in life is to never sin again. That is a really tough road to walk. Because what your goal in life shouldn't be focused on not sinning. Your goal in life should be focused on loving God and being in his presence. Your goal in life should be enjoying God. If you're in his presence, join God, guess what? Sin is going to get less and less and less and less and less and less and less. How many of you can stand up, raise your hand, stand up and raise your hand, because you have to do both, and say, I don't sin. I never sin. I have not sinned in the last, you know, 10 months, not once. I'll give you 10 days. Not sin once, you know. In fact, I'll never sin again the rest of my life because I know I'm not sinning. And then I will call you a liar. <laughs> Which you may not know is a sin. <laughs> but think about God. The big, big God in heaven. I mean, the guy in charge, okay? Okay. He gets you born again, he recreates your spirit, makes you brand new, puts you in Christ, sees you in Christ, and leaves the flesh with you. Why? 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 Have you ever asked that question? You know, <laughs> and he says this in his word. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And the grace of God will abound in you. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Peter indicated and communicated that he found his greatest strength in his greatest weakness. 
And what we do is we actually learn, according to Jesus, him who has forgiven much, loves much. And the more we realize how much God has forgiven us and how much God is changing us and how much God is loving us, the more we love him. We have been left with this body for the purpose of having the freedom to choose the way of the spirit and not the way of the flesh. And if you, fo- if you walk the way of the f- spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here it says in the book of Galatians, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It does not say your flesh will not lust. It says you won't fulfill it. So you have the power to walk away from sin of this world. And, and sometimes... Sometimes you make mistakes. Not me. <laughs> let's, let's continue. I want to see some other things. I want to talk to you about being in Christ. Galatians 6.15 says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Paul writes the exact same thing, almost word for word. One, he says, circumcision nor uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. In other words, he's saying Grace and works are being a Jew nor Greek doesn't mean anything. Approaching God in faith does. Being a Jew or Greek doesn't mean anything but approaching God in the new creation, a Jew or Gentile. I use the word Greek, but I was referring to Gentile. Paul writes in the exact same book, one chapter later. He didn't write it in chapters. He just wrote the, the letter. He says in chapter 5, circumcision or non-circumcision doesn't get you anywhere. And there was what you do doesn't get you anywhere. Then he says it again. But what he's trying to say is what does get you someplace is you believing that God has made you something different. God has made you new. God has created you into something unique and and special. Do you have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 2? Look at verse 4. Here's what it says. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, that word for rich means a whole bunch, means a lot. There, there, you know some rich people, like you may not know them personally, but you know of Warren Buffett, that he's pretty wealthy. You know of um, Bill Gates is pretty wealthy. You know that there are, they list, Forbes will put out the top wealthiest people in the world or the country and stuff like that. Would you say that they're rich? Would you say if somebody is worth $30 billion, would you call them rich? Somebody said no. I'm just talking financially. It didn't mean they have a lot of money. I'm, it's, this is not a trick question. I would love $30 billion. I would take one. I wouldn't be greedy. I'd take one billion, give you the 29. Okay? But I would say someone who has $30 billion has a lot of money, and in the value of the world and looking at the world, they would be rich. I would call that rich. Would you call that rich? I'm trying to get you on the word rich. Now, think of that in the where it says that God is rich in mercy. Rich. In other words, he's got more than anyone else. And here's what it says, but God who is rich in mercy, he can spend his mercy and never run out. God has so much mercy in the bank that it's getting interest and he never touches the principal. And he can't even spend the interest. He has so much mercy that it cannot be expended. It cannot be lost, cannot be absorbed, cannot be used up. And God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Say it in another way. The reason God has so much mercy is because he loves us and he wants to do something good in our life. Continue. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised, listen to this, and raised, is raised future tense or past tense? Only two people answered. Is it future tense or past tense? Past tense. And raised us 
up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My friend, you need to understand that you may be sitting in a chair at Church of Grace in the city of your Belinda, but at the exact same time, you are also a resident of heaven. That you are in Christ in heavenly places. That you also live there. So well, I, I, I just don't get it. Neither do I. But it's true. You may not understand how it works, but somehow you're here and there. Maybe there is here. Maybe you just can't see it. Maybe there is always here, it's just never seen. Maybe here is always there, but never seen. I don't know. But I think time, space, and substance is very different in the kingdom of the spiritual world of God. And what he's saying right here is that you are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what's that mean? Let's continue. Verse 7. That in the ages, listen to this, that in the ages to come, have you been saved for ages? How long is an age? Have you been saved for ages? Now, this is a trick question. Because I don't think any of us have been saved for ages. We're still in the first age. There's ages to come. Many, 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 many years to come. Look what he says. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you understand that you are in Christ, then you understand that God's goal is to show his kindness to you. That's very different than the image I was raised with, the image I had, or the image that, I've had, that I assumed in my mind of God being a mad God. What the Bible is trying to tell me is that he's looking for ways to show his kindness to you. He had me stand up here at the very beginning of this talk and say to you, he's proud of you. He cheers you on. He's really glad what you've done. And he's trying to communicate that God in Christ, in Christ Jesus, well, because you are in Christ, he is going to show, he's going to take ages and ages. And Paul is using this term to say it will never end, that he wants to show his mercy to you, his kindness to you for ages to come. When some of you think that you have run out, let me, let me, let me back up and put it another way. Do any of you approach life with, Things have gone pretty good the last three or four months, so what's going to bad about to happen? Do any of you do that? Yes. Do you ever think about, do you ever go into life, whether it's a day or a week or a month or a season, like you're thinking, oh man, I, I think something bad's going to happen because it hasn't happened for a while. That is the mindset of the world and not the mindset of being in Christ. In Christ, God is not trying to set you up for something bad. He's trying to set you up for something good. There's more kindness to come. There's more goodness to come. There's more provision to come. There's more mercy to come. God's got more and much more for you because you are in Christ, being in Christ. So let's take that phrase. If you would, if you would take the phrase in Christ, do a search in the epistles alone, you'll be overwhelmed what belongs to you. I've taken that phrase, being in Christ or in Christ, and I have, what I've done is I've, I've put it up here to say, you need to see who you are in Christ. You need to see yourself in Christ. Then you will see what you have. You will also receive what has already been given to you. You will live in what is yours, and you will have better Christ-like results in life. This phrase, in Christ, is throughout the whole New Testament. And every time you see it, you will usually, 90% of the time to 98% of the time, you will find a Bible verse that benefits you, something that God has done for you, something that God has done in you, something that God is going to do for you in the future.
And by looking at these Bible verses, and I printed out a whole bunch at home and I went through and I just picked out the top ones that I thought I could squeeze in in my time allotted on a Sunday morning. But there are many, many more. But if you will study them and research them and think about them and meditate on them and just read them, your life would be changed. And the reason it'd be changed is you'll start seeing that you belong to a family and the family is the family of God and there are benefits for being in Christ. If you were a little child, you're seven, eight years old, you're in an orphanage and you're in a third world country and you're um, somewhere and you live in walls that are made of some brick but dirt floor and some wood A-frame ceiling and you got to have soup or some kind of mush once or twice a day. And you're seven, eight years old. And somebody walks into that orphanage and they adopt you. When they adopt you, do they leave you in that place? Or do they bring you to their home? So let's say somebody from America comes in and adopts you. And the person that comes in and adopts you uh, doesn't have dirt floors. They have a much larger house. They have carpet, they have tile, they have running water, they have a toilet. Now, you are now part of the family. Guess what? All the stuff that the family has comes with it. And you get access to the toilet. You get access to the refrigerator. You get access, and this house has a swimming pool and a jacuzzi and a slide into the swimming pool. Guess what you get to do? You get to slide. You get to swim. You get to soak. <laughs> you get to eat. You get to shower. You get to use the toilet. You've been adopted because this world has had nothing but dirt floors. You've been adopted by someone whose house is called a mansion, whose streets are made of gold, who talks about their their castle that has 12 different layers of 12 different stones that goes 1,500 feet high, or excuse me, 1,500 miles, I think it is, high, and 1,500 miles wide. It's a cube, basically. So guess what? You've been adopted into that family. Why are you sitting in the corner on dirt waiting and wishing you could have something that's already been given to you? If you realize who you are in Christ, then you realize what comes in the mansion is healing for your body. What comes in the mansion is stability of your mind. What comes in that mansion, what comes in that mansion is length of days and long life. Blessings and honor and favor and mercy and grace and kindness and forgiveness. What comes in that mansion is healing of relationships. What comes in that mansion is wisdom and understanding and knowledge. What comes into the family that you've been adopted in, it, a whole bunch of stuff that already belongs to you and you need to quit asking God for it and start receiving from him and start walking in it and believe that he's already done it. So here's some Bible verses I'm going to throw at you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I'm going to say something that you're not going to like. Some of you, because you hold dear to these sacred cows. You hold dear to these things. I want to do a sermon called Things Christians Believe That Are Not in the Bible. It's just not there. Okay, let me tell you, let me tell you something. According to this Bible verse makes this belief not true. There was a thing that went around, this is about 10 years ago, but I still see it here and there, where people go around and what they want to do is they want to find out every sin that your dad did or your mom did, and you need to confess it, you need to be cleansed of it, and you need to get it out of you. That doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. This says that old things have passed away. All things have become new. Guess what? In the world, in this world where, remember this circle of people right here? These are non-believers. In this circle over here, these are believers. These people are subject to whatever their family tree is going to pass down to them. The sins of the father is going to be passed down, passed down, passed down. 
You talk about, well, I, I've got this illness because it's hereditary. According to this Bible verse, if you are in Christ, you belong in a new family, in a new mansion, in a new place that you could receive from a new family tree. You can go over to this family tree and talk about, in my family, we have this, you know, and I, if, when I go to get a physical, they'll say, okay, is there any of this in your family? Is there any, and they go through this whole list of stuff. And over here, in this family, there's healing. So what family tree are you going to associate yourself with? Which one are you going to grab? Which one are you going to take? Which one are you going to say, I have to have high blood pressure because my dad did, my grandfather did, and his father did, so I have to have it. If you believe that, you will have it. But you come over here to this family tree, and in this family tree, there's a whole new life and a whole new vine that's going to give the branch life. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branch, you can't do anything without, without me. Guess what? I'm, I have access to a new family because I've been adopted. But I've been made new. I've been changed. Okay, another one is second, is, um, second Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, but when? Now. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You are not going to get closer to God one day. You are as close as you can get. You have been brought near into his family, but you have to stop believing that I have to earn his presence and start receiving his presence. You have to accept his presence. Philippians 3.3, 3, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. What that means is how many times do you disqualify yourself from an answered prayer, from healing, from God intervening, from a miracle because you think you do not deserve it because of your lifestyle and what you have done. According to the Bible, God is rich in mercy to show his kindness for ages to come. And he wants to take anybody at any place in life, wherever your journey is. And when you call on the name of the Lord, he wants to save you. And that doesn't matter where you're at in your journey. You could already be a Christian and you've, been, you've done some things. Every one of us know people who are in a backslidden state. And I use that phrase to say they used to be actively, actively involved with Christ, but now they're not with Christ. You know, they're not involved in church. They're not involved with Jesus. They're just, you know, they, they, they have not disbelieved, but they just don't have anything to do with them. It doesn't matter where that person is. As soon as they call in the name of the Lord, God wants you to show his kindness. God wants to show his mercy. God wants to give his blessing to them. He wants to help them. He wants to love them out of wherever they're at. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God. Do you know what the word righteousness means? It's this big, long, multi-syllable religious word. Righteousness. Most of us only speak in single syllables and sometimes we venture to two. But righteousness simply means that you're right with God. God's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. How is it that you are right? Are you right with God because of your behavior, what you have done, the things that you have accomplished? What you, no, you are right because you are in Christ. Not by our flesh, but we are in Christ. Romans 8, 3, um, 39 says this, nor height, and I love this one, nor height or depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It says in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God. God loves you and you can't get separated from him. Imagine, imagine you, you are in a speedboat and God is on a tether on one of those bananas. And he's holding on, 
And you are going everywhere you can to get away from the love of God. And he never falls off that banana. You know what I'm talking about, right? You've seen those things. You usually get going, throw the person off. God wants, God wants you to know there's nothing you can do. He's never, ever going to let go. If the banana pops and deflates, he's still holding on to the tether. He's holding on to that rope. He's got that. He's not going to let go. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In my teaching of English, and, and uh, never mind, not going there. It says, who has blessed. To me, that means past tense. That means it's something that's already done. It's already comp accomplished. It's done, right? Has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Has blessed. Now, it goes back to being what home are you in? What family are you in? I'm going to go back to the two camps. I have the camp of the unbelievers right here of this world. He hasn't blessed them with every spiritual blessing because they have to come into his family. Those who are in his family, all the believers that are in this world, all of the new creations, he has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing. So if I've already received every spiritual blessing, if I've already received that, I've already have it, I already have been, a, uh, that's already mine, then I don't need to be in this house and ask, I need to thank and receive. Does that make sense? I heard a story. I don't know if it's true or not. I've heard so many preachers use this story, but it came to my mind. And it makes a lot of sense. This is years back, you know, uh, when there was a boat that you would get on a boat and you would go, the way you would go from Europe to America is a boat. And this one guy, he saved up a bunch of money to get a ticket to come to America and start his life. Probably he's going to preach. <clears throat> preacher telling story is going to be a preacher, probably. And the guy saves up all the money, buys his ticket, and what he does is he packs in some crackers and some other things and some canned goods and puts it in his little stateroom. Stateroom is a really big term for this room he had. So he's in there, and, um, and it's a long voyage from Europe to America, several weeks long. And he would walk by and he'd see the people in the dining room, and he'd see them eating. And he had his crackers and some canned goods and some other stuff in his little stateroom. And he'd nibble on those and try to make them last for the whole trip. And he'd walk by and see the people eating at the different meals. And so when he was coming to port in America, one of the porters asked him, he says, oh, sir, I'm sorry, but have we offended you somehow? And he says, what do you mean? I noticed that you never came in and dined with us. And he said, well, I didn't have the money. I only had enough money to buy the ticket. He says, sir, the food was included in the price of the ticket. What you don't know can kill you. And what he didn't know that was already his, that he just had to walk in, go to the host, ask to be seated, open the menu, and pick an item and eat. He didn't have to go ask for it. He could just receive it. According to this Bible verse, every spiritual blessing has already been granted to you when you called on the name of the Lord. It would be odd for God to save you, but not willing to heal you. It would be odd for God to save you and not willing to help you get a new job or get a job. It would be weird for God to save you, but deny you your very basic essentials of life. And Jesus made the statement to prove that this is still true. Don't worry about tomorrow. And don't ask God for what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. God knows you need those things. They're provided in the ticket and the ticket was paid by Jesus' blood. Amen. Your healing is paid for. Your relationship restoration is paid for. Your sound mind is paid for. Your healthy body is paid for. Your finances have been paid for. Your provisions have been paid for. Your future has been provided for. Your blessings have been granted, have been secured, and have been sealed by the Holy Spirit Himself. 
My friend, you're in a family. You being in Christ is something big, something huge, something that is enormous that belongs to you. You have rights that you may not know came with the ticket. Get into the Bible, read those verses on in Christ, find out all that is yours, and start seeing that God has already done something for you. Let's close our Bibles, turn off our devices.